we want to say we want to say a good morning, a good afternoon, and I even think in some cases there's probably a good evening. And I want to thank you all for joining us for this special discussion on the fourth New York Botanical Garden Triennial Exhibition with the American Society of Botanical Artists. As Katie mentioned, I'm Michelle Conklin, director of the Tucson Botanical Gardens. So this traveling exhibition is currently on view at, in Tucson um, in the Legacy and the Friends House Gallery until May 8th. The garden's mission is to connect people to plants and nature through art, science, history, and culture. And this exhibition fulfills everyone, checks all those boxes. A special thank you to our local sponsors, the Southwestern Foundation for Education and Historic Preservation, for making this presentation and exhibition possible. And special thank you to Carol Wooden of the American Society of Botanical Artists for entrusting us with this beautiful collection of art. So I'd like to introduce today's speakers. All are accomplished artists, but each represents the entirety of this exhibition. We have an exhibition director, a juror, and a juried artist. So first joining us is Carol Wooden. Carol is the exhibition director of the American Society of Botanical Artists, which is based at the New York Botanical Garden, lucky her. An award-winning artist, she has worked as a freelance artist for over 30 years, and her works are in collections all over the world, including but not limited to the Smithsonian Institute, the Shirley Sherwood Gallery at Kew in the UK, museums in the Netherlands, and at the Marciana Library in Venice, Italy. Next, we have Susan Fisher. Susan is both a botanical artist and art educator. She is the former coordinator for the Botanical Art and Illustration Program at the Denver Botanic Garden and the former director of the Art Institute of the Art Institute at the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum. And her illustrations and sculptures appear in numerous periodicals, private collections, and Susan was one of the three jurors for this exhibition. And finally, we have Joan McGann, one of the juried artists. She has a Bachelor of Fine Arts in printmaking and drawing, and Joan received a Certificate of Excellence in Botanical Illustration from the Desert Museum's Art Institute Certification Program. In 2007, Joan was commissioned by our garden to create 18 illustrations of plant specimens at the gardens for education and commercial purposes, and her work can be seen in periodicals, private collections, and also we're very grateful that Joan is a member of the garden's board of directors. So a little housekeeping. If you have any questions, please place them in the chat box where we'll address them at the end of the presentation. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Carol Wooden. Hello everyone, welcome. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Tucson Botanical Garden for hosting Abundant Future. In an unusual turn of events, this is actually its premier live venue because of what we've all been going through the last two years. So we're really excited to have the show on view there. And I'd like to thank Michelle and Katie and everybody that made it possible to have the show in Tucson. So ASBA is devoted to perpetuating the practice of botanical art and through its outreach to promote awareness of the role plants play in all of our lives. One of the ways we achieve these goals is through our exhibitions program and through this triennial exhibition that we produce collaboratively with the New York Botanical Garden. Each triennial highlights a different theme and with more people gardening at home, smaller scale farms and farmers markets becoming more and more popular and plus the importance of the topic, we thought the timing was perfect to address this theme of cultivating diversity in the food plants that we eat and the plants that we use. We were really excited about the power of the artworks to spark a new way of looking at these plants people interact with every day. Included in the exhibition are heirloom crops, crop wild relatives and ancient cultivated plants. So those are the three categories of plants that were eligible. Um, the exhibition of course is beginning its travel schedule here in Tucson. And then it will travel next to the Woodson Art Museum in Wausau, Wisconsin, and then on to Denver Botanic Gardens in Colorado. Come and see the exhibition if you can here or at one of the other venues. And you can also read the stories behind each of the artworks in the exhibition on our website. And those are some really fascinating stories. 
Next slide. So bringing stories like this to the public through botanical art is one way that we fulfill our mission. And we knew the theme would also challenge our artists and for some would present a steep learning curve about what exactly qualifies as an heirloom or what is a crop wild relative. ASBA provides some resources to artists, but artists really have to go out and make their own connections and do their own research to find suitable subjects. So in this case, artists are not just inspired by the aesthetic attributes of their subject, but then they're taken down a road where they learn about their subject's history and the ways in which it might be relevant to contemporary global issues. This topic encouraged relationship building between artists and those in other disciplines, including horticulture, farming, science, history, and art. And on the left picture here, I'm looking at purple corn grown by Hortus Arboretum near my home in the Hudson Valley. And um, in the middle is one of Asuka Hashiki's famous heirloom tomatoes in progress. Um, Asuka first learned of heirloom tomatoes at the Union Square Farmers Market in New York. And since she's returned to Japan, she has developed friendships with uh, people who grow them and she's grown a lot of them herself. And then on the right is Susan Tomlinson, who has been working on a project documenting diverse cotton species and cultivars with Texas Tech University scientists in Lubbock. She said she lived in cotton country her whole life but didn't know what the flowers nor the balls looked like. Mm. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to show a few, just these three works from the exhibition kind of as examples of some of the work that you see if you come to see the show. Um, each of the artworks chosen has lessons to teach about the evolution and future potential of our botanical heritage. And these are the three medalists that were chosen by a jury team at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, on the upper left is Akiko Inokido's painting that shows a very special pumpkin variety that's been kept going for over 200 years in the city of Kyoto, Japan. And there's actually a whole um, festival devoted to this pumpkin every year. She shows all stages of the plant's life from flowers to fruit. And on the right is Mariko Ikeda's painting of Joram Pandanus, and it depicts a similar story, but one in which local people in a Microne Micronesian atoll have selected the wild pandanus over hundreds of years so that some cultivars produce nutritious and edible interiors, and its leaves are used to build roofs and make mats and baskets. And then Jean Emmons's painting of eggplants shows the immense variety of eggplant cultivars and species. Eggplants are believed to have mainly originated in India, but then they spread around the world and were changed at each step along the way. And what, there's one species in the painting that's a wild relative, and that's the orange one that comes from Ethiopia, and it's African. So Within the exhibition, each artwork tells a different unique story about useful plants and their world travels, as well as their alterations over generations and millennia in some cases. Each artist had to research their subject and visit farms and other locations, sometimes multiple times, or grow their own and do a deep dive into their subject and how to show it in their chosen medium. Next slide. Hi, this is me. This uh, is Ella Campaign, and I chose this particular specimen to represent me as a juror for Abundant Future because traditionally this plant has had lots of uses, you know, medicinal uses, traditional uses like uh, for digestive problems and respiratory problems. So um, I'm not going to talk about it a lot simply because it's done in graphite and uh, I had some other things that I thought would be more interesting. Next slide. 
what I've chosen to show you here is just a little bit of a process for solar plate etching, for uh, polymer printing, if you will, polymer printing, it's also called. And this, ha this specimen happens to be the American chestnut. And just a little side note uh, about, I guess just to reinforce why it's so important to talk about abundant future, because this is the American chestnut. This particular tree was growing in my neighborhood and uh, many years ago, there were 400 million American chestnuts growing in the United States, particularly back east where Carol is. And um, it got a kind of a blight, an invasive fungus blight of some kind and wiped out really literally the entire population of American chestnut. They're very few and far between. Um, they're working on hybridizing them and making them stronger so they can fight the fungus. But anyway, so just underscores the importance uh, of the uh, exhibits like this. Next slide. Okay, and that's just a finished drawing. Next slide. I'm gonna take you through this process uh, with this cabbage because who doesn't love a cabbage? And because I just happen to have enough pictures to just kind of give you an idea of what this process, this printing process is like. So what you're seeing now is a drawing on frosted glass, glass that I frost myself by smearing carborundum on one side of the glass, putting another piece of glass over it and rubbing that glass together until I get a smooth frosted effect. And then you wash that all off and you draw on the frosted glass. And this is the finished image that I drew on frosted glass. Next slide. And what you're seeing now is kind of sort of the end process, but uh, let me take you through it just a bit. What you're seeing on the left-hand side here is the printer, he's helping me. You're seeing a plate, which is lying on that uh, print bed, if you will. And on top of that, print, you're seeing some little fine pieces of paper that I've just put on there uh, to that will go through the press along with the print and adhere to the paper. And the process is called shin -cole. Um So then what happens is he puts the paper down, you can see the the print goes underneath all those blankets there on the right hand side of your screen. And it's pulled through the press, the press is exerting about 1500 pounds per square inch. Uh, on the print as it goes through and comes out the other sli side, slide, side, slide, slide, please. Thank you. And then this is the finished image. We're going to see it again here. So let's do another slide. There it is. And let's do one more slide. There we go. So what you're seeing here, of course, is the finished print, but also you can see the bare plate with the ink on it. I just thought you'd like to see what that, what that looks like. And a solar print is just something that's, um, it's, it's, we don't use acids to produce a solar plate image. It's a kind of a polymer solution. So it's less uh, damaging to the environment and to the artist working in this particular medium. And I just thought you would like to see sort of what that looks like. Next slide. This, this doesn't look like anything, does it? But this was a very exciting project because it's, a, it's the beginnings, it's the organization, if you will, of an image I did of a bujum tree that is growing actually in the Tucson Botanical Gardens. It's doing very well there, thank goodness. And you can see by the sketchbook and the little um, kind of color swatches to the right-hand side of the glass, uh, that I've kind of gotten an idea of what sort of colors I might use. And I've made <clears throat> some compositional sketches below that. And now you can see all the straight lines, horizontal lines, vertical lines, diagonal lines, all those lines have been drawn on a piece of paper that I've slipped behind my frosted glass. And I will draw kind of using those as a guide. They're just a guide to help me place elements in the drawing and the final drawing that I'm going to do to just make sure that things don't uh, line up too much that, um, you know, that the horizon, things aren't too straight or too um, compositionally sort of confusing visually, if you will. And 
once I get the drawing on top of this grid, I pull that grid paper out from behind there. So it looks chaotic in the beginning, but um, it's just a placement device. And then you can see my um, pipe insulation there on the left-hand side with all the toothpicks in it. And that, that was just a little exercise I did for myself to, to, to reinforce in the drawing, to reinforce the form of this bujum tree and to reinforce the, the growth habit of where the little branchlets come out of those trees. So I just did that as an exercise to see, um, you know, kind of what that was like. Slide, please. And then this is just a picture of me in the Tucson Botanical Gardens, and that is the beloved bujum tree. That's a lovely specimen, I might add. Next slide. And this is the drawing. You can see I've slid the uh, grid out from behind it now, and I'm uh, I have I have another piece of paper behind it though, so I can see what I'm doing on the glass, and I'm just kind of finishing the drawing here. And then, next slide. This was the result of all of that. And the you know I might I might say that the Fucaria. This is a Fucaria columnaris, but this particular uh, Fucaria is related to the Fucaria splendens that you might be familiar with, the Ocotillos that um, are a little better known than the Bujum trees. And the, the botanists that found the Bujum tree, or recorded it, I guess you would say, um, called it the Bujum tree. Its common name is the Bujum tree. And they named it after a poem by Lewis Carroll. And then the name of the poem was The Hunting of the Snark. It was a poem he called an agony in eight fits. But what the, the end result of this poem is that you don't really ever know what the Bujum is. And so because this was such an unusual looking plant, they called it the Bujum tree. <laughs> Thank you. Next slide. Yeah. Oh, me. Hi, this is Joan McGann. Thank you for having me here today and uh, letting me show you some of the work that I've done, botanical art that I've done. Um, it's been about 15 years ago that I got started. And um, also, I've been a member of ASBA for a little bit less than that. And it's been a great opportunity to uh, to learn so much more about plants and to be able to exhibit my work too. This particular image is the one that's in the Abundant Future exhibit. It's the San Rafael Quince. And um, I found this, this tree at Mission Garden, which I'm sure many of you know about here in Tucson. It's uh, it's on the side of a, of a historic Spanish colonial walled garden. And today they grow uh, heirloom crops and heritage fruit trees and lots of uh, many native uh, plants and garden and garden crops as well. Um, I spoke with Jesus Garcia, who is an ethnobotanist at the Desert Museum. And he is also the founder of the Kino Heritage Fruit Trees Project. And they began the orchards at Mission Gardens. Um, this quince itself was propagated by Mr. Garcia from uh, a tree from the San Rafael Valley, which is uh, close to the southern border of Arizona. And uh, Jesuit missionaries brought it to that area in the 1600s. Um, my drawing is in pen and ink, obviously. I, um, I use line and stippling to create my drawing and to create the form. I blew it up a little bit here so you could see that, that it's all just uh, dots. And I'm not crazy. I'd love to do it. So uh, next slide. Um, then the next few slides are, are uh, just a very quick overview of the process that I that I have. This is <clears throat> this is not the first drawing. The first drawing is is a lot of sketches put together that I've that I've done on site. 
unfortunately, um, blossoms here on cactus in the desert don't last very long. So I did spend several days out there drawing the different angles that I was seeing on all these blossoms, but then they're gone in just a very few days. So I take all of those sketches and I clean it up a little bit, simplify it, and I will eventually end up changing some of this, but I transfer this onto the paper that I use, which is a, a Strathmore illustration board usually, uh, and, and in this case, and then I start inking it. Next slide, please. And so this is the completely inked drawing. I, uh, I knew I wanted the color of the blossoms were so beautiful. I knew I wanted to use watercolor with this. So um, I, I left a lot of the, of the form development <clears throat> off in ink because I wanted it to not only be uh, developed in ink, but also in watercolor. Uh, next slide. So this is the final piece. Um, and I, I add some ground plane to it uh, so that it sits on the page. I've added this arm at the lower bottom and a, and a blossom at the upper, uh, the upper left. Um, did I say the lower bottom? The lower, <laughs> the lower right. Um, and so, yeah, it's called Apricot Glow. Uh, it's a hybrid called Apricot Glow and it's, um, uh, it was beautiful. It just lasted a few days though. Uh, next. Oh, the next one, I'm just showing you what I meant by uh, uh, creating some of the, the form and, and uh, shadows and everything with color rather than with the black, with the ink. Next. What have I got? This is an obvious, uh, a very standard native plant, the Arizona barrel cactus. Uh, one of the reasons that I love uh, ink with with the cactus that I draw is, is because of all those spines. Um, seems to be the thing that works the best. And even in the body of the, of the cactus itself, it's sort of a soft, velvety uh, surface. And I think that the stippling lends itself to that. I, this happened to be in a handy location for me. And I also liked the fact that it had uh, lots of uh, fruit and flowers on it at the, at the same time. Next, please. Um, this is the, a, a, fig, a branch of a fig tree that is from the children's garden at the Tucson uh, Botanical Garden. Can I just say TBG? <laughs> Do people know that? Um, it was in uh, the last triennial that was part of the New York Botanical Garden and ASBA. Um, it was uh, trees in public gardens. Um, and I, I wanted the, to draw, see a lot of the, the figs and they kind of were on the underside of the branch. So I climbed over this bench and got underneath the tree and laid on the ground. And uh, I tried to draw that, it was hard. Uh, I, had to, I had to mostly work from photographs. Um, and I, I took a couple of leaves. Don't tell Michelle that, but um, anyway, it was, uh, <laughs> It was a, a fun drawing. The, sh the light and shadows coming through there were a lot of fun and I was trying to capture that. This is all graphite piece. Uh, next, please. This is a colored pencil drawing of a Pima pineapple cactus. It's, uh, it's an endangered species. This drawing is uh, 19 by 28 inches and really the the specimen, the plant itself is, is maybe five inches tall. So I 
I, I blew it up. I fell in love with the colors that were here, just such, uh, just so they're such subtle colors and the, and the forms on the body of the cactus, the tubercles, I think they're called. Um, and I was able to go, go into uh, the Desert Museum's uh, nursery where they were propagating the, these uh, Pima pineapple cactus and um, probably with the help of Susan, who was the, the um, director of the Art Institute at the time, and I was in the certification program. I'm sure that got me in. Um, and I just, I drew the flowers because uh, in an aerial view, because they were so beautiful, I thought. So I added those up there. Um, next. Um, this is a devil's tongue barrel cactus. Um, this is the first time I had done it, but I'd always wanted to include the ground around the cactuses that I was drawing. And, um, and so I did. Uh, I did it in graphite, uh, the background in graphite, so that this specimen that I was drawing uh, actually stood out, but it was it was certainly fun to uh, to draw all that, <laughs> and I've done it since. But uh, a couple of other drawings, but this is just I just happened to favor this one, so I shared it with you. Um, and then next slide is um, eight, it's eight of the eighteen drawings that I did for TVG. Um, they're all colored pencil and they've used them for uh, several different things. And I, uh, I just, uh, they're all just plants in bloom at the garden. So uh, of a lot of the draw, I mean, I've drawn maybe 20, 25 drawings just being in the garden at Tucson Botanical Gardens, and uh, it's a great place to uh, find beautiful plants. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to show you some of my work. Well, thank you, thank you. This has been so much fun. So I, I wanna go back to Carol because I want to give um, our audience a little bit of background about the American Society of Botanical Artists. So Carol, why don't you give us a little bit of overview about it and how and when it was organized and, and things like that. Michelle, I think Carol's gonna talk about her work before we move to the oh, question. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, forgive me. Oh, that's okay. I'll just, I just have two or three slides and I'll be quick and we'll get to that question. Um, this is my painting in the show. It's of a vanilla orchid. And I chose the vanilla orchid partly because I've painted so many orchids throughout my uh, painting career. And I've, I've always wanted to paint a vanilla orchid. I've seen them a lot, but I rarely see them in flower. So, um, in this case, I found the leaves at the New York Botanical Garden in the conservatory there. So I did studies of the leaves. And then I was out at the Huntington Botanical Gardens in California, and they had it in flower. And it was producing these, uh, these lovely seed pods that, of course, eventually turn into the vanilla bean that we all know and love. Um, vanilla, I, I also want to paint it because vanilla has such an interesting story. You know, it's, it's native to Mexico. It was uh, grown there for many hundreds of years. And at one time, nearly all vanilla in the world came from Mexico. But about the mid 1800s, an enslaved child by the name of Edmund Albius on the island of Reunion figured out how to hand pollinate the flowers. And that had been the problem was that people could not get the flowers easily pollinated because they were pollinated by a native bee in Mexico. But once he figured out how to pollinate the flowers, then um, people started to grow it around the world. And today its major producers are Madagascar and Indonesia. 
So I work on watercolor and this is a watercolor on vellum and vellum is a type of leather. And I'll go to the next slide and talk just a little bit about, about my process. So um, there are several artists in the exhibition that have done uh, beautiful paintings on vellum. And um, if you see the show in person, you'll learn how to recognize it when you see it. Um, so I always start the same way. I have a study, which you see on the left. And I did the study in the fall uh, after I got that ear of corn that I showed you earlier. And um, I try to work from life and spend at least a few hours with my subject uh, as soon as I see it often when it's still in the ground um, and try to capture the kind of dynamic quality and the color and the detail so that when it comes time to make a finished painting, I've got all the information I need or nearly all the information I need. And um, even though it's a quick process, I've learned over the years what I do need in the future because sometimes I paint the final painting right away. And other times it's, it can be years between the time I do the studies and the time I do the painting. And then as you see on the right, I start out with just these very faint um, layers of watercolor and I build color up gradually. Um, and this is a, a piece of vellum that I've stretched over a panel. Um, next slide. And so this is uh, the study on the left, which the color balance is off because I, I take such terrible photographs, but the, the um, image on the right of the completed painting is pretty accurate. And you can see there are just minor differences between the study and the final, one being that I've tilted the corn a little bit, I've changed a couple of the husks, I moved that broken piece of husk over a little bit, which I always knew I was going to have to wait until I got this on the on the board to figure out where to put that. And then um, all the little uh, the little corn silk um, was still on that ear of corn. That ear of corn held up remarkably well. It just was a little bit drier, but it was really useful in doing this final painting because the kernels almost looked identical. And of course, those big dark kernels are what you really wanna want to show. And I have to tell you, I found that black corn silk around my studio. I'm still finding it around my studio. <laughs> I can't get rid of it. <laughs> so that's that's it. I'm. I'm finished with that. Okay, thank you, Carol. Okay, it's all pretty inspiring. So let's get to some questions where you can give us some background on the American Society of Botanical Artists. So um, ASBA is a nonprofit with a mission to provide a thriving interactive community dedicated to perpetuating the tradition and contemporary practice of botanical art. We've got a membership of about 1900 and we're mostly from the United States, but we have members from usually between 30 and 35 of other countries on any given year. And we have a little over 40 institutional members our artists, our, our members are mainly artists, but we're not all artists and it's open to membership for, to anyone. So it must be really inspiring to be on the grounds of the New York Botanical Garden. Is that, is that so? Well, um, that was a great moment in our history when uh, Rob and Jess uh, talked to New York Botanical Garden about possibly hosting us and they agreed to do it. And I think it was 2009. And um, we consider ourselves extremely lucky on so many levels. Uh, the staff, of course, is talented and they're terrific to work with. And the library and conservatory are world renowned and of course, always uh, jam packed with interesting things. And the grounds are always beautiful and ever changing. So um, when you work there, you don't take as much advantage of those beautiful grounds as you should. But um, I do, I've been trying to make a point of getting out in the garden and looking and seeing what's, what's on view when I'm there. And you know our missions uh, coincide in many ways. So we just don't think that there could be a more ideal relationship. 
That's wonderful. I know uh, most public garden professionals have that same problem of forgetting to get off of our chairs and out into the gardens. <laughs> so the triennial exhibits that you produce, can you tell us a little bit about that? How long you've been doing that and what inspired you to form, to form that? Well, shortly after we moved into our new space, we did start talking, of course, about exhibiting at the New York Botanical Garden. And so we began to plan to co collaboratively produce this exhibition triennially and then jointly decide upon the themes that draw attention to some contemporary issues and topics around plants. And our first was in 2011, it was called Green Currency and it was about plants and the economy. The second one was called Weird, Wild and Wonderful and that featured botanical oddities and that was a really popular show. Um, and the third exhibition was hosted here in Tucson in 2019, it was called Out of the Woods, as Joan McGann was talking about. It's about trees and botanical gardens and arboreta. Okay, great. I, okay, so we do have a question from the audience um, from Amelia. She said, hi, Joan, beautiful illustrations. I'm wondering what sort of ink you use prior to adding color with watercolors. Um, I was curious myself because I was thinking, how would those not bleed? Oh, it's a permanent ink uh, in a rapidiograph. Uh, it's just an India ink, Kohenor, or that's just a brand name, but it's permanent and it does not, it doesn't bleed. So thank heaven. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, and Susan, um, you mentioned um, painting on the glass. What did you rub between the two sheets of glass to get the frosted effect? Yeah, I, um, I should probably clarify that I drew on the glass and the glass was exposed to a polymer plate and the polymer plate and the glass sat out in the sun hence the term solar plate etching, until the plate was fully exposed and then cleaned off and so on and so forth and inked up. So I, I didn't make that clear. I just sat here and realized, well, you, you know, that was clear as mud. But anyway, so that's that's what happens. And what, what I use to frost the glass, the glass has to be frosted between, between two, you need two pieces of glass to do this. And it's carborundum. Carborundum is what I used to frost the glass with. It's very messy, um, really messy. It's just messy, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I was wondering, I've, I've looked through all of your websites, of course, and, and have each do each of you work exclusively with botanical art and illustrations or have you ventured out into some other media? And we'll start with, uh, we'll start with Susan. Oh. Me, okay, um, do I do, yes, I absolutely do everything I can get my hands on. It, it, it's just, it's so, I feel kind of guilty and bad um, because I just cannot seem to stick to one thing. So I've dabbled in sculpture. I've done a lot of plants in bas relief and sculpture. And uh, I started out as an oil painter. So I still like oil painting. And then I got enamored of pastels and do a lot of pastels and even taught, I think, at the Tucson Botanical Gardens. I taught a class flower portraits in pastels years ago. And um, so I'm sort of all, all over the map, but it's, th there's just nothing like a botanical illustration in, in my mind. And it just kind of calms me down. And I just, I like the focus. I like having that kind of focus on a subject for extended periods of time. So it will always remain uh, important to me. Okay, and, and Joan? Well, I guess the, my, the majority of the work that I do now is botanical art. The only other thing that I that I do is uh, do quick landscapes and studies of plants in uh, in a journal when I'm just traveling or something. Uh, but I too just find the 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 a very calming effect of of um, doing and drawing in such great detail. But even when I was in college in a fine arts program, 
I mean, you couldn't do anything representational back in the 60s mm -hmm. and 70s when I was there, <laughs> long time ago. But every amorphous form that I ever drew in college, I did with the greatest of detail and with the same materials, colored pencil, graphite, and pen and ink. Uh, they weren't as good a quality materials as I try to use today, but so um, um, I'm, I'm pretty much just on one track, I guess. And, and Carol, uh, I love it. <laughs> Carol, have you ventured into other media? Uh, not for a long time. I have to say that once I started to do botanical art, first of all, when I before I did botanical art, I worked in oils and graphite and pastels, and I hated watercolor. <laughs> but um, for some reason, I I. I uh, started to use it for botanical art so that I could get the detail and I was using it almost like drawing with a pencil. So I am a one trick pony. I, I only do botanical art now and I mainly, 98% of the work I do is watercolor. So um, I'm, I've kind of uh, excluded that. And I only, um, I, once in a while I'll do a little critter but uh, almost everything is botanical. Wonderful. Well, Carol, I mean, other than nature itself, um, are there, what artists have inspired you? Oh, you're going to hear uh, artists, uh, botanical artists are like other artists inspired by all different kinds of artists. And I, um, I love looking at illuminated manuscripts. Uh, you know, they're mostly on vellum. They were produced throughout Europe in the Middle East and into Asia from about 1100 to 1600. I, I just love uh, the detail and the beauty of those and how well they've held up. And I love portraitists like uh, Hans Holbein and Hans Memling. And I guess they're very early to 1500s. Um, I'm a big fan of landscape painting. I love the Hudson River School, and I really love the new modern realist movement that's going on out there. And I think a lot of uh, botanical artists will say they love Georgia O'Keeffe, too, who's closely associated with um, Arizona, of course. So um, those are a few of my favorite things. <laughs> <laughs> and Susan, how about you? Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm like Carol. I, I just I have so many I hardly know where to begin. But <laughs> but I, I have a few that Carol hasn't mentioned. So um I would say Beatrix Potter was uh it was was so amazing to me because she discovered the reproduction mechanism of mushrooms and was not even allowed to uh share her research with the Linnaean society because she was a woman um nonetheless now she finally has credit for that but still I think that's just um astounding that she managed to do that on her own and then um, I really admire Rudolf and Leopold Blauschka. They did the all the drawings. They traveled all over the world. They went to Jamaica and they were all over the United States, all over the Southwest, everywhere. This this father and son doing drawings, doing and only drawings. They they did not use a camera, although that could have been available to them, but they didn't think that was very useful for their studies. And they were this German pair. They did all these studies and then they went back and they made the glass flowers that now exist. Um, they were created for to study botany at Harvard University. And now the collection, you may know the collection as the Ware Collection, which um, this woman named Ware uh, kind of hired them to do it. She hired these German people because they knew how to work with the glass from doing Christmas tree ornaments. And um, so they had, they had a skill set that was three or 400 years old. And um, I think to travel around and do something like that had to be just absolutely uh, amazing. So I'll... I, and I just want to say one thing. I want to say there's uh, a woman named Shirley Sherwood who is not a botanical artist, but she has, I think, probably more than any other human being, really put uh, botanical art on the modern map. And so she deserves some some credit. And I have to say, I am inspired by her. And I think so many artists are inspired by uh, her ability to have collected paintings from artists all over the world. She uh, built a gallery at Kew Gardens to house her collection and I was just absolutely amazing. So while she's not an artist, she's definitely an inspiration. Okay. 
Wonderful. Joan, how about you? Anyone different? Um, well, I, because I love to draw, some of the old uh, the old masters like uh, Van Gogh or Duyer or, or uh, Leonardo da Vinci, I love their drawings. And Van Gogh has the most beautiful ink drawings of, his, of uh, the landscapes that he would do. But, you know, I'm also just uh, very, just very impressed with the contemporary botanical artists that I have come to know, or at least have, have seen their work. Um, uh, it's, it's quite a group of people with the most, they all have their own hand. And um, you, can, um, you can recognize many of them just from afar, their work. Um, and I've been very influenced and, and I appreciate their work so very much too, so. Well, I know we have to wrap this up, but I have one more question and it's probably more for Carol. Um, Carol, do you see any change in the future of botanical art going forward or have you seen much of a change over the past period of history? I have to say, I, I've been in the field for about 30 years now and I never could have imagined how many people are doing botanical art. I could have never imagined how broad the expansion of botanical art is and how many people are finding something in it. I, um, and I think that's going to continue going forward when um, both Susan and Joan mentioned the process of being drawn in so closely to these botanical specimens and what it gives the person that is being drawn in, the artists themselves, is something you can't really find anywhere else. So I think that people are, are looking for something that botanical art is providing and I think it's just going to keep growing and growing. That's wonderful. Um, I do have one more question and it's from a member of the audience. Um, just quickly, this, this um, person is an editorial artist and got her certificate in natural science illustration, but curious to know what the entry into the scientific illustration field is. Is that too large of a question for the, the small amount of time that we have left? I don't know who best could answer that. What, what does that mean, the entry? Like, um... How did you all get started in scientific illustration? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure everybody would have a different response to that. Absolutely, um, I would think it's it's. There hasn't been a lot of formal programs until I would say the mid '80s in the United States, anyway. So um, I think we all come to it from a different perspective. Maybe Carol. I don't know. Help me out, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always drew, but I never drew plants. And I guess I it it came to me through hiking. You know, it seems odd, but I started to see native wildflowers that I had never noticed. And so since I always drew and painted, it was just a natural thing to happen. And then I found a book about Margaret Mee and I thought, oh my goodness, I, this could be something you could do for a life. So that's how I got started. That's wonderful. The certificate well, program at the Desert Museum is, is uh, how I got started with uh, drawing. It, it's it's a, a nature illustration, but I, I really did focus on, on plants. And uh, I learned a lot there. And, uh, and then I was introduced to ASBA and, and we have incredible conferences that, that if you're a beginner, you can, you can learn so much from the classes that are given. And, uh, and if you're well into it, you can teach or you can, you can just keep on taking classes and learn something new every time you go. So I would uh, encourage anybody who is interested in, in uh, trying to, to join ASBA. It's a, it's a terrific uh, society. Wonderful, well, thank you. I, I think just like most public gardens, um, it's a generous community and um, 
I believe that artists fit into that realm as well. I want to thank you, Carol and Susan and Joan, for your time and your talent. And behind the scenes, a big thank you to Katie Rogerson, who's our Director of Education and Community Engagement for manning our Zoom technology and helping uh, hold our hands through this. And of course, the Southwestern Foundation for Education and Historical Preservation. We encourage you all to join the gardens, visit a garden. Um, if you're interested in learning more about this exhibit, I'll play Vanna White right now. The book, um, Abundant Future, is available in the gift shop right now. There you go. Uh, but again, thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope to see you at the garden or on a Zoom presentation in the future. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks everyone. Abundant Futures on display here at the gardens until May 8th. Can I go have a glass of wine now? <laughs> <laughs>